Comrade Chair and Comrades. Two economists recently shared the Nobel Economic Prize. One, Eugene Farmer, for his work on so-called efficient financial markets. This, by the way, five years after one of the most devastating collapses that was triggered off by what happened in the financial sector. Another, Robert Schiller, was, work for, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on behavioral finance. Their theories actually aim to help the speculators, the capitalists, to exploit the financial markets. And this alone indicates the sham character of the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize. It's a reward in effect for the theoreticians for the political and economic representatives of capitalism itself. More to the point, these theories diametrically contradicted one another, and yet they were both equally given a Nobel Peace Prize. This sums up the blind alley of capitalist economists at this stage has been demonstrated in the last five to six years in particular. Leon Trotsky once said, that in the modern era, and he was speaking almost 80 years ago, official capitalist political economy is dead. The ruling class, the capitalists, stumble from one expedient to another. Let me give you another quote, more recent, from the last couple of weeks, in fact, a week ago, in the Saturday edition of the Financial Times, when Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, of the USA, nominally the most powerful capitalist economist in the world at the time, presided, and he presided over the beginning of the crisis of 2007. Now he concludes, and here I quote, while I was sitting there at the Fed, I would say, does anyone know what is going on? I couldn't tell what was really happening. What a confession of bankruptcy of the most prominent representative of the ruling class of capitalism expressed in his own words. Now, if you look at Britain, there's a certain amount of soul searching going on in the universities amongst professional economists. It was revealed in an article in The Guardian this week when it pointed out that Robert Lucas, who also got a Nobel Prize in 2003, actually said at that time that the central problem, problem of, the, of depression prevention has been solved. He didn't mean it in a psychological or a psychiatric sense. He meant it from an economic point of view. Now his fellow economists gathered at a meeting <coughs> in Oxford in the last couple of weeks, and one of them said, hang me and my fellow economists for the lack of foresight in relation to the crisis that began in 2007, deepened in 2008, and went about six years into the crisis at the present time. In, the, in answer to this, we also had a very interesting development amongst the students at the university who protested about the courses that they were given, that were dealing with bare economic facts and outdated theories, and they had no uh, uh, correspondence and no teaching in the ideas of radical economists, particularly in the ideas of Marx itself. And that's an indication of the way that this crisis has produced on the one side a soul searching amongst the ruling class who is seeking, seeking an explanation, who is seeking a way out of this crisis as I will explain a little bit later on. And on the other hand, the best sections of young people who are beginning to look towards the ideas of socialism and Marxism and finally try and find an explanation of what has happened, but also on the basis of that, an explanation of what should be done and what the programme should be in the period that is now opening up. Now it's legitimate to ask if there's anybody here who's not a member of the Socialist Party who's come along to have a look and to participate and listen to this discussion. It's legitimate to ask, well, what did Marxism, scientific socialism, did they fare any better before the crisis of 2006, 2007? 
And we have, we have to say, yes, we had a more consistent analysis, we believe, than any other trend, than any other uh, force within the labor movement, in the sense that we predicted that capitalism was, uh, was heading for the rocks. Let me read an article at the beginning of, the two, of 2000, which we wrote in our paper. We wrote, a financial system collapse will plunge the world market into a depression, meaning mass unemployment, mortgages foreclosed, and even people's savings disappearing. Barclay is so big, of course, they'd expect to be bailed out when in trouble. Now, isn't that a, a, an accurate expression of what actually happened? Even down to the fact that the savings of people in Cyprus were expropriated as the backwash of this recession itself. Why were we able to make this analysis? We were able to do it because we based ourselves upon the methods of Marxism. We based ourselves upon the fundamentals, yes, but not just on the fundamentals. If you take Marx's capital, as Franz Mehring once said, he was a, a German social democrat, wrote a good book on Marx, he made some mistakes in that book, but he said in the course of examining Marx's ideas, capital is not a Bible. There's all kinds of possibilities we can get out of that. Karl Marx did not complete capital. He intended to write four or five books after capital. He didn't have, surprisingly, a, a conclusive, worked out theory of crises. There's hints of it in, in parts of capital, but there's no systematic treatment of this, which he intended to do, but he ran out of time before he died himself. We also then have to locate our ideas from that in the concrete situation, including the new features that come up in the course of the development of capitalism itself. We are not dealing today with the capitalism of Marx of the 19th century. We're dealing with it in the 21st century. And it'd be ridiculous to expect a science, which is what Marxism is, to merely deal with fundamentals and not try and grapple with the reality as it develops subsequently in the process of its de development. We cannot, that is Marxism appear, like evangelical Christian sects, taking out one aspect of Marx's writings and building the whole church on the basis of that particular aspect. We have to take Marx in the round and see that it's a means of analysing the situation today, but you don't automatically get an answer to all the problems of capitalism based upon capital itself alone. Some basics before we proceed to discuss what were the features of this crisis. Capitalism is a system based upon production for profit and not for social need. Profit, uh, surplus value, surplus product comes from the unpaid labour of the working class. The struggle over the share of surplus labour or surplus product it created by the masses is the basis of the class struggle. He who controls this surplus has the key to economic power, the state, culture and ultimately political power as well. We had a glimpse of this, didn't we? In the display of the dictatorial demands of the owner of Inimos Ratcliffe at the Grange Mouth refinery in the course of the last week. Sitting a one billion personal fortune and an announced two billion pounds worth of profit, some people try and argue it wasn't really a profitable fair, it was leverage, it was based upon uh, loans and so on. That is not true, but it doesn't make any difference. Because in the course of sacking the workers at Grangeberg, or attempting to sack, sack them, or holding a pistol to their head, he, 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 he used his position, his dictatorial power, to try and bring the working class to its knees. What was our demand? It doesn't matter whether he's making a profit or not. Our demand was to open the books. That was carried in a leaflet of ours by the Scottish section of the CWI. By the way, that was taken up by UNITE, by the UNITE organiser on the spot. That in turn leads to the demand if he confesses bankruptcy, if he professes he's got these profits, it doesn't make all that much difference. If he says he cannot afford to maintain this plant in operation, it poses the question 
of taking over that industry, of nationalizing that firm, and if necessary, all the firms on the site itself. The full implications of this will go into the rally this evening. Now, what are the roots of this crisis? Well, actually, you can trace it back to the 1970s when capitalism was facing a serious crisis, actually a serious of profitability at that stage, and they got out of that partly on the basis of the attacks on the working class, on the ideas of neoliberalism that were implemented in Britain and implemented abroad, and in effect they were facing a depression -based situation in the 1970s. They got out of it through globalization and through neoliberalism that lasted for an extended period of time. The argument that's put forward by some people that this in no way has altered the share in wages and profits and the division of that is absolutely off the wall in my opinion and is contradicted by the facts and the reality of the working class as I hope to show in these opening remarks. Together with an enormous extension of credit through financialization, a big element of what is called fictitious capital, but not, a, not, not, a, not, not, not exclusively, not completely, it was in, in, in effect that replaced investment in the industry for the production of, of property, of value of real value, if you like, on fictitious capital, but not completely on fictitious capital, because it also generated investments in China, in Eastern Europe, and so on, which, which, which allowed a, a, an outlet, if you like, for capitalism at that particular time. It could be compared to an elastic band that was enormously stretched over decades, as a matter of fact. Now, normally, this produces inflation. However, the huge investments in China, the flood of cheap goods, which itself was determined by the collapse of Stalinism and the beginning of the opening up towards capitalism, this also produced a flood of cheap goods, which kept, which normally, if you would have had this kind of credit injection in, in capitalism in another period, you would have generated inflation. But it kept it down through this cheap goods that came from China and Eastern Europe. And a byproduct of this, by the way, in a sense, is the creation of new industries of new value, was in the development of, of the industries of China, of Eastern Europe, and so on, which in turn has created, begun to create a big working class that will play a key role in the period that we're going into. Now, this was only possible, I want to stress, by the entry of new sources of exploitable la la labor in China and Eastern Europe itself. But at the same time, there was a massive building up of debt bond bubbles. Some, like Gordon Brown, thought they could de deny, they could defy economic gravity, the laws of capitalism of boom and bust, the economic cycle described by Karl Marx. We counted all these arguments for a new paradigm. Now I want to say here, right at this juncture, there can be a number of immediate triggers for an economic crisis of capitalism. There can be, for instance, a disproportionality between different industries, if you like, under capitalism. There can be excessive credit, credit in the previous period, and this was undoubtedly one of the factors that built up to the situation which burst in the bubble. There can be periods where there can be a falling rate of profit and even a drop in profit, a drop in the mass of profits, as I will explain a little bit later on. But one thing is clear about this crisis and the lead up to this crisis and, it, and its manifestation in the last six years, it was not created by a falling rate of profits. If anything, it was in the lack of demand which is one side of the process of capitalism, and Marx understood this and commented on this in relation to the development of capitalism itself. A situation where you have an enormous mass of surplus value which cannot be absorbed because it cannot be sold. I'll come comment on that in a little moment in time. Incredibly, some people, in my opinion, they would discredit Marxism if they were allowed to get away with it, actually argue that the process of neoliberalism 
has in no way altered the actual co uh, configuration of capitalism and that the working class's share never increased or never in increased percentage wise, that the profits of the capitalists were on a secular decline for 20 or 30 years. This is all contradicted by the facts which I hope to relate here today. For instance, in an article, amongst many articles I could quote, there's an article in the New York Times. This is on January the 12th of this year. And the article says the following. Whatever else happens in Washington, wages are stagnant. For millions of workers, wages are flatlined. Take Caterpillar, longer symbol of American industry. While it reported record profits last year, it insisted on a six-year wage freeze when the wage, wage freeze was 49%. For the great bulk of workers, labor's shrinking share is even worse than the statistics show. When one considers that a sizable and growing chunk of overall wages, overall wages, let me say, which is included in the income that's given in the national statistics of the campus, goes to the top 1%, senior corporate executives, Wall Street professionals, Hollywood stars, pop singers and professional athletes. The share of wage wages going to the top 1% climbed to 12.9% from 7.3% in, in 1979. Then we go on to use an argument that unfortunately is used by some on the left. Wow, but what about the compensation that workers get through increased health spending in welfare services as well? Some economists say it's wrong to look at just wages because of other aspects of employee constant compensation, notably health costs have risen. But overall, employee compensation, including health and retirement benefits, has also slipped badly, falling to its lowest share of national income in 50 years, while corporate profits have climbed to the highest share. I have a sheaf of reports here from the capitalist press, from the Wall Street Journal, and they should know. Non-financial U.S. corporations are sitting on more than 1.8 trillion in cash and liquid assets of 30% from 2008. The biggest U.S. banks are wrestling with an intractable problem. It is not a surge in loan defaults, a wave of cyber attacks or mounting lawsuits. It's far more serious than that. They're on the verge of making too much money. That's the dilemma that faces the capitalists. Here in the Financial Times, Times of two days ago, high profits, uh, 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 there's a whole article devoted to that. We have in the, in, the, in, the, in the Economist, profits have been booming in America, reaching the highest proportion of GDP since the Second World War. It's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to argue against the empirical facts as they have come out in the course of material in the past itself. At the same time, we are accused by some people in, in silly arguments of saying that when we talk about financialization, in some way, this is like a new and higher stage of capitalism. We don't say that, but we don't say that this enormous credit bubble was just a normal situation. It was unique in the sense of its size, and moreover, the after effects of also being unique in prolonging and deepening this crisis that we have at the present time. We expected the collapse in 2001, but it was, accept, it was offset by a new injection of liquidity from the central banks of capitalism. This only piled up the debt mountain, which reached its limit and collapsed in 2007. Not only did we analyze the roots of the crisis then, but we said because of what had gone before, the character of this recession or depression or slump, the, the, describe it as you would like, would not be just an episodic development. It would be longer, it would be drawn out. The major problem, I repeat, is the massive accumulation of surplus, which in the words of Marx, cannot be realized, cannot be sold, because of the factors that the New York Times have described 
of the lack of demand, of the lack of an ability of the working class to buy back these goods. Those who argue that the falling rate of profit is the cause completely, completely misunderstand this crisis. As I pointed out, Marxism does not have a monocausal explanation of the crisis. We don't say, it doesn't have like a, a one explanation of the crisis. It will, be, it will vary, it will depend upon what has gone before, what is, and what will be the situation in the future. What is the tendency of the rate of profit to decline? Let us just give a very brief explanation of this. It's very simple to understand if you understand Marx's categories. And I, I know that the comrades who are here today who've not yet been through, if you like, the basics of Marxism. That's unfortunate. I hope that this debate will stimulate your interest. But Marx described uh, uh, constant capital, the investment in machinery, means of production, and so on. He described that as constant capital. Constant because it didn't pass any, on any value in the labor process. On the other hand, variable capital was the only section of the, of the gross capital that produced new value, produced surplus value, if you like. Now, Marx pointed out the difficulty was, because inevitably throughout history, the constant capital grew, and the variable capital became a smaller and smaller component of that. The difficulty, said, he said, was not to explain the historic tendency of the rate of profit to decline, but the slowness of its decline. And he said, well, that's due to countervailing factors. What were they? The cheapening of constant capital through the development of productivity. The increase of what he called relative surplus value, the exploitation of the working class. These were countervailing factors that he said could mitigate the tendency of the rate of profit to decline and cancel it out for a whole historical period. Because this was reflected over a lengthy period, and by its slowness, I repeat, it was very difficult to see the tendency of the rate of, of, of capital to decline. Also, the fall in the rate of profit. What is the optimum rate of profit for capitalism? It's very difficult to work out. By the way, it's very difficult to work out the rate of profit on the basis of the statistics of the bourgeois who go in for miscalculation consciously and deliberately in the modern epoch. There's no such a thing as neutral statistics when we're discussing the share of the working class or the share that's going to the capitalists in profits. But one of the ways to overcome this, Marx said, was by the growth of the mass of profit. And therefore, it can be offset. These processes, of the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, can be offset for a period. Inevitably, at certain stages in history, this can be a factor that can trigger the crisis. But not in this crisis. Not on the basis of what is uh, being produced in material in the press. Even Dali Alexander, the present uh, minister, liberal minister in this coalition government, is pleading with the capitalists in Britain to invest, he called, 500 billion pounds worth of surplus that's lying in the vaults of big business. The evidence is overwhelming. There, there are no mar markets because of what was described there, the aggravated cuts in the living standards. In fact, sections of the bourgeois now in America and in Britain are coming out for raising the minimum wage, for in in increasing the share of the working class because they're in this blind alley now, which capitalism does not appear to be able to get itself out of. And even if you have surplus value, I want to repeat this point, even if you produce surplus value, and it has, you then have to sell that, you have to then realize that surplus value. And that's what Marx says, but realizing means you have to exchange the surplus value, if you like, for money in the form of sales. It's not there at this particular moment in time. The living standard to the British working class, not according to me, but according to uh, Fra Francis, uh, the General Secretary of the TUC, whose name I forget for a moment, she said that the wages of the working class in Britain have been cut by £52 million pounds in the last five years. That's an enormous cut in the market. That explains more, rather than the healthy profits, 
of big business at this particular moment in time. How ludicrous you will get yourself, how ludicrous a position you'll get yourself into if you go public and say, well, profits are big business. You know, they always want themselves say, our oh, profits, uh oh, they're, they're record profits. <coughs> the representative of the working class say our living standards have been depressed. And we go before them and say, no, no, no. Your, your profits have actually sunk dramatically and the living standards of the working class has gone up. This is not a realistic way of approaching the working class of Britain or the wealth for that matter to explain the crisis. Are we under consumptionists? I could pull a number of quotes from Marx who says it's a tautology. This is the favourite quote of some, some of our opponents who say that you cannot solve the problem by, by uh, 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 a tax on the consumption. Says, I'll give the exact quote if the comrades want. You cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, solve this problem of underconsumption. It's existed in capitalism. It's a basic fact and so on by increasing the wages of the working class in isolation. That's in effect the Keynesian solution. And by the way, not today, not yesterday, but in an article in 1978, we wrote a, we wrote a very thorough piece on Keynesianism. And we said the following, the whole labor movement will of course support the demand for increased expenditure on schools, hospitals, housing. We offer a program of useful public works to so-called the unemployed. The capitalists have created this crisis, let them pay for it. But who will pay for the increased expenditure? If it is to be the capitalists who increase taxes, they will have to they have less to invest. Factories will not be built, then the queue of the unemployed will grow. If it is to be the working class, then this will cut the market and have the same effect. If, on the other hand, the government finances it by printing money, as did the Tories under the Tory Chancellor of Barber, Without it being backed by the production of goods, this would result in inflation. On the basis of capitalism, what is given with the right hand will be taken back by the, back, by, by the left hand. Comrades, some comrades think that because we talk about financialization and we talk about the nationalization of the banks, that we want to restrict ourselves to that. No. But where you have the enormous unpopularity of the banks today, in concrete circumstances, we would demand the nationalisation of the banks and we would agree with those workers who are calling for the jailing of the bankers as well. We have no illusions that this would solve the problem. It would create new contradictions in capitalism. Because just nationalising the banks, although the Bolsheviks in 1917 in, in Lenin's little pamphlet uh, of, of a threatening catastrophe, the main demand there was not nationalisation, of industry was the nationalisation of the banks because that was the key, if you like, to the uh, overwhelming means of production at that stage. So we support the nationalisation of the banks. In Portugal, in 1973, the nationalisation of the banks led to 70% of industry being take taken over. Such was the interpenetration between, if you like, uh, finance capital and the capitalist uh, regime as a whole. Comrades, there are other figures that are being given, which in my opinion, in no way contradict what we're trying to say here today. But that will come up now, no doubt, no doubt, in this discussion and the debate. More important is this discussion that we're having today, is the theoretical underpinning for the much more and interesting question of what prospects for capitalism today. The first point we like to make is there's no final crisis of capitalism. Only if the working class seizes the opportunity and takes power, then you will have an end to the chaos, the dislocation and the waste which we see before us at the present time. And if you look at world capitalism at the moment, capitalism is beset by doubts. In Europe there is a depression, that's what it is, where unemployment is between 15 and 25% at this moment in time. For young people, it's much higher than that. One quarter of young people throughout the world are either unemployed or, or don't, are not in training, but they cannot have a place in society. In reality, we have stagnation and deflation which besets the world economy at this moment in time. I recently did a review 
for a book that's being produced on America called The Great Unwinding. It was a review for Socialism Today. That showed the enormous collapse that has taken place in America, where, for instance, 80% of the population of the middle class now believe that their, their offsprings will not have the same living standards that they have. That's up, by the way, from 50% of something like two to three years ago. The IMF says the world now, or, or a few months ago, said the world is, is a three-speed world economy. Europe is in depression, but, but the US is recovering, they said, and the neo-colonial world that they refer to as the emerging markets are healthy. That's no longer the case. Even the threat of withdrawing the drug of QE that is quantitative easing, that the state has pumped in to maintain American capitalism, even the threat of tapering off this QE has led to a crisis in the emerging markets who, of course, used a lot of the liquidity that was used for speculation, which threatened to be pulled by what happened in the US. Instability is indicated by the deadlock over the financial, over the US fiscal deficit. And this, by the way, is another example you can't have just the, the, uh, the examples I gave in relation to a trigger for a crisis, but a financial development can trigger a crisis. After all, the argument that is put forward, we had a fall in the rate of profits in 2007, and that triggered the trigger crisis, I'm afraid is not true. It started in the foreclosure markets, it started in the property markets in the US, it had an effect on the finance houses, and the finance houses tri triggered a crisis. But you have a situation now where the US faces, it's a dysfunctional situation, the political uh, regime in the US. The prospects for Europe are absolutely dismal. I have before me here a report from the Red Cross of all people that gives an absolutely terrifying, terrifying picture of the situation that's developing in Europe in the moment. I won't give all the detail of my comment on it at the rally this evening. But suicides of women in, Cre in Greece have doubled, directly attributable to this crisis. 600,000 in Germany, in Germany, the economic powerhouse of Europe, say they do not have enough to live on. There's about 150 million people in Europe who are unemployed, or if you take Greater Europe, Russia, Eastern Europe, and so on, there's 11 million people who've been out of work for a year. In Germany, 5.5 million people in the last six years, seven years have gone from the middle class into the ranks of the working class. That's preparing the ground for an enormous upheaval amongst working people in Europe along the lines of what we saw on Greece, but on a much more grandiose scale. We've had this year the movements in Turkey with the mass occupation of the squares. We've had the tremendous movement in Brazil. I was privileged to go to Brazil on behalf of the CWI. And one of the very few, by the way, who went to the Amazon. Most, Amazon. most Brazilians have never been to the Amazon. But this movement that developed two months ago, in which our comrades from the CWI played a crucial role in explaining what was taking place and intervening, it was triggered by a 10% increase in fares and, and triggered off a movement that involved 120 cities with 2 million workers being on the streets at any one time. The situation was so explosive that the strikes that took place in the occupations, the numbers outnumbered the people who were at the Confederation World Cup, and that doesn't ha ha happen very often. The situation in Brazil is such, and this is characteristic now of the neo-colonial world, whether you have an upswing or whether you have a downswing, such of the accumulated discontent, an explosion will take place. For instance, Brazil had a 7% growth rate up to this year. That triggered a movement of the Brazilian work as a strike wave with the attitude we want our share. We've been kept in the dirt, we want now a share of the profits that you've produced. When the steam ran out of that boom, it triggered these mass occupations because of fair increases that were cancelled out, because of the infrastructure and all the accumulated discontent of the working class itself. That was followed, let's remember, by the second revolution in Egypt itself. <coughs> all of this is an indication 
of the change that's taken place as a result of the political effects of this crisis. I haven't had time to deal with the developments in Greece, in Germany, in Spain, the slowing down in China that has taken place, that they now managed to derail that by resorting to the printing press once more, resorting to a stimulus package. But nevertheless, you will never have double-digit double growth in China ever again. It's down to about now 7% growth. They're managing to maintain that to stabilize the situation. But such is the unstable position in China that if you have a growth rate of 5%, then that will result in mass unemployment and could trigger off a similar explosion as we saw in 2008 itself. Trotsky once said that the levels of unemployment in the 1930s in the US meant that the working class was already prepared economically for socialism. What he meant by that is that capitalism was incapable of integrating the most dynamic section of society in, into society. That is the young people who constitute the young working class. That exists now on a monumental scale. Of 66% of young people in Greece, of a similar figure in Spain, and not much less in Italy, and of course the million in Britain. When Russell Brand went on the television of a week ago, unguarded, like, a, like a, an unguided missile, very appropriate as we approach Guy Fawkes Day, an unguided missile exploded. Jeremy Paxman, for once, was tongue tied. He didn't have much of an alternative, but he called for a revolution. It produced apoplexy in the ranks of the spokesmen of capitalism. One of them commented, well, he was explaining what is a pre-revolutionary situation. Now, from a political point of view, that's an exaggeration in Britain today. But from an economic point of view, as Trotsky commented about the 1930s, well, we're in the 1930s now, that from an economic point of view, capitalism is in a pre revolutionary situation. The symptoms of that is in the very heart of capitalism itself. Those figures I gave you of the way that the middle class have been plunged into the ranks of the working class. The split between the Republicans and the Tea Party. The fact that I have a, 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 a I have here a, a, an item from one of the papers in, the, in America that now says that 60% of the population of America favor the third party. That's not just an abstract idea. Our comrade in, in uh, Seattle is on the verge of an outstanding victory. And I'm talking here about being elected as a council, which is the, the possibility of being elected similar to an MP. It's not guaranteed, there's a week to go. But the trade unions are lining up uh, around that. Similar situation in Seattle. There's no other left organization got that profile in America. Some are bigger in terms of numbers, but none have been able to mesh with the outlook of the working class in America as it moves into opposition. And paradoxically, America has been prepared for socialism because it hasn't had the incubus of mass communist parties or of social democracy. Yes, it was used as a scarecrow, by different capitalist governments in America to frighten the working class away from socialism. And there's still huge reservoirs of backwardness. But the more advanced elements of the youth and the working class are beginning to see the way forward. And they will embrace socialism and, yes, Marxism in the next period. Capitalism cannot absorb the, the new devices, the technology that have been developed by the genius of the working class. And that is a repetition of the 1930s as well. A new phase of capitalist growth, of course, could not be ruled out completely. <coughs> but that would only be possible now, and by that I mean a return back to the situation of the 1950s and 60s. That's only possible if what happened in Greece was, was repeated on a European and on a world scale. scale. In other words, a mass impoverishment of the working class. And that would then create the basis, if you like, for a higher rate of growth of capitalism, of investment and so on. But could anybody imagine that after what we've seen in Greece, with 20 or so general strikes and a 48 hour general strike, could anybody imagine that with the movement of the Spanish workers being what it is, that they would be able, that capitalism would be able to get away with that? There's perplexity. There's no mass party of the working class. But the objective situation is such 
that that will be created in the course of the struggle and by the work of people like us. There are people who say, well, the danger is of a fascist and right-wing coup in Europe. We don't minimise it anywhere. The attacks that have been made on the working class in Greece and elsewhere. We don't minimise the rise of Golden Dawn. But even the bourgeois government of Greece have been forced to rein them in. These are auxiliaries of the capitalists. They'll never be allowed to take power, like Hitler and Mussolini did, because the ruling class itself understood they were expropriated then, politically expropriated, by the fascist regimes, and they caused such blunder, such bloodshed, that their demise led to revolution, a revolutionary way, which took place at the end of the Second World War. So they'll never give power to these dogs, these auxiliaries of them. Be more, it would be a Bonapartist coup, a military coup. But even that is very risky. And they will not resort to it before the working class has not had one, but a number of opportunities to take power. That's what we, the, the Socialist Party, and that's what we, the CWI, are all about. That's why this discussion today is not an abstract discussion. It's not curves of capitalist development or decline. It's not graphs. It's the living reality of the class struggle, ultimately, that is determined by the capacity of capitalism to develop the productive forces. They've shown that in the blind alley. Obama in America gives, all, gives the, the impression of being just somebody who's managing decline. He doesn't have a real alternative to the situation at this stage. So therefore, comrades, let's discuss this issue clearly. Let us come to sound conclusions, we hope, in the course of this discussion. I look forward to the discussion because that's the way on the basis of the discussion, clarification of ideas, we can build a mighty movement that can arm the working class to take power and establish socialism.